But the, this is the thing with Afrobeats is like, it, it needs to feel like a performance. It, it needs to be cohesive. So every single element needs to have a sense of believability within that it does exist in that reality. I, I've been asked, how'd you blow up the low end like that? And, the truth was I reduced the low end like substantially. Jesse Ray Ernster is a Grammy award winning mix engineer who's worked with some of today's top artists. In today's video I sit down with him to discuss his journey mixing Burna Boy for over 5 years, the key to making amazing sounding Afrobeat mixes, how he shaped Doja Cat's hit song Woman, and his new leap into the world of audio plugins. I believe you've been mixing Burna Boy for 5 years. Yeah so it's been about 5 years, uh, my role and the gig and the expectations has really not changed too much it's it's always been really really clear with him that you know when he delivers a reference mix um that is true to his intention that's the vibe and that, that's what he's going for so um ultimately it's it's kind of my job to stay out of the way but i i usually like to to go for it and see how far i can push something um oftentimes the productions are really really well laid out so it doesn't it doesn't need anything more than just you know some subtle refinement and just massaging to take out a half db here or there and more of like a really subtle kind of mastering style approach but uh, but there's other records where it's like there's some serious opportunities to like really extend the low end or or get the whole track bouncing a certain way and Sometimes the intention is there, uh, and you can hear it. You can hear what they were what they were going for, and, and I can just I'm able to come in and kind of help get it there. That get that last uh, couple of percent. I wanted to talk about his most recent album, Love, Damani. I think I'm saying that right. Hopefully, of uh, Damani. So, what was it like mixing that album? It was intense. It was really, really quick changeover. Uh, so I got the call on a Sunday night, and they needed the entire album. Uh, you know, what, 18, 19 songs delivered, mixed by Wednesday. And I didn't have any of the files yet, with the exception of the single, Last Last, which we had already mixed and was about to come out at that point. Um, so yeah, went into a little bit of panic mode for like five minutes and then uh, called over some team members to come help. We set up a little bit of a camp. You know, we had computers in the room, so we had a prep station, a mix station, and kind of a note station and we got through it it was a lot of fun some late nights and we just submitted the mixes to him um you know over iMessage or sent them to his team virtually and and there was one mix session over zoom where we he would just listen through and give us a few tweaks to make and and in that scenario we actually didn't we didn't do any tweaks or make the notes on the spot because we were just in a playback session, you know, where we had all the two tracks just laid out. We were kind of sequencing the album, getting the flow right. Uh, so we just took his notes down. And I said, okay, we're going to hit these and, and then we'll just send you guys in the pass afterward. Did you have to make a lot of major changes to your workflow when mixing that album with a really tight deadline like that? No, but you know what? It was funny because I was frustrated at the time. I thought, man, if we had so much more time, I would have the time to really dig in and give these records, you know, what they needed or what I thought they needed. And I was just so close to the records and it was so much work happening. I was just a little bit overloaded that my perspective was gone. I couldn't see the forest through the trees because I was just in, was in it. I was in album mode. By having that limitation set on us, uh, you know, having that time restriction, it actually, it allowed me to stay really high level with the moves. Um, and I was able to just sort of sift through and, and really do only the necessary things to really make the song speak and listening back now it's like oh my gosh this is this is this is wonderful it's it's true to what he wanted and in a lot of ways it's not the perfectly shiny sculpted thing like we did on twice as tall which was the album we did before that which won a grammy uh you know that one we like mixed it for a while and i can kind of hear that it's it's like it's very eq'd it's, it sounds like i just kept eq'ing <laughs> <laughs> but it's what at that time it was what I was going for. Like really, I wanted to do a really clean, shiny thing, and we were all cool with it. So I want to talk about one song specifically on that, and that is "Last Last." The drums on "Last Last" are like crazy, knocking, massive. Do you have any advice or philosophies for getting those kind of just just getting that kind of huge sound? Totally. Well, it all starts with having a producer like Chopsticks. 
as those sounds, those sound choices. Um, Cause yeah, when it came in, it was huge. If, if anything, like I, I've been asked like, man, what you, you know, how'd you blow up the low end like that? And the truth was I reduced the low end like substantially from where the reference was at. Cause a big part of how that one like pushes outward is is just how it was driving into the buses, the busing on the master. Uh, you know, I think there's a couple of clippers and maybe a limiter doing something to to really just sort of catch it, but and crunch it and make it kind of push outward before it like pushes downward. And but yeah, the the thing with that is is, is that a lot of the low end was perceived, I think, because I think most of the smack comes from the way that like. 1k was pushed on the drums you know i think i think the reason it sounds big on small speakers is is because the mid-range is present and the mid-range had a lot of attack and a really like thoughtful uh character with how it was pushing and um kush omega twk plug in on the on the kick that was that was one thing that added a lot of character <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted to ask about another burn boy credit and that is alone so, mm. that song when i listen to it it's crazy it's kind of like a movie i feel like and it was on a movie soundtrack as well but there's chance there's like beautiful string arrangements on that record so was that different mixing that record as opposed to your kind of typical uh, burn a boy record it was very different mixing it because i had the pleasure of co-mixing it with mix giants my uh, prodigal assistant from back in the day. He has spread his wings. He's flown on. And he is a, uh, you would need pretty big wings though, because he is uh, over seven feet tall. He is a very, very large person. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we got to co mix it. He invited me to mix on this Amare track that was on the Black Panther soundtrack a few months prior to this. So then I got the invite to do this one for the Black Panther. And I said, well, let's reciprocate. Uh, you know, you brought me in on that. That's that's awesome, man. Come do this one with me. And we got to. It was so cool. And luckily, Disney just had the budget to pay two mixers, so we, you know, nobody was like hurting or compromising on the pay that was fair for us to feel like we could dig in and do the right job. And we we just we got to split the workload in half. You know, he would do a little bit and close the session. We had it sitting in a Dropbox folder, and then. You'd text me like, hey, change this and this and this. And, you know, then I would open it up and listen. And, of course, I would undo all of his decisions. And then I would, would like, you know, do it the right way. And uh, after that, you know, a little bit of back and forth for a few days. Uh, we felt we felt great. We submitted it. It was it was cool. They actually changed the record like two or three times, which was uh, uh, a process. But that that is pretty common and that happens, too. So I think we mixed like two or three different versions of the song, but once we landed on it, it was great. Uh, Noah, like I gave him all the credit in the world. Mix Giant did like the vocal mix. And that's like one of my favorite Burn of Vocal sounds I've heard. Uh, Noah got a really, really big low end out of Burner's voice and it was really even. And, and of course I went in to look and it was all the tricks that I taught him, of course. Now he did a phenomenal job. So I stole some of those tricks and, um, you know, I don't even remember what I did on that. I, I, in fact, the current pass that came out may have been like mostly Noah mixing it. Maybe I did some of the beat. I don't recall. Uh, it was fun though. It's it's fun to mix with other people. I don't remember the technical parts of the mix at all, but I remember uh, my interaction with human beings. That That's what I love. I think like your Afrobeat mixes and you just have like the way you mix drums, there's like this space and... <laughs> there's this groove that you get that not a lot of other, at least like kind of modern hip hop mixes, which might be more kind of slammed in. Um, I feel like you just, your grooves have this like awesome space and, and, um, and groove to them. So do you have any advice for getting that sort of feeling with Afrobeat like type grooves or really any yeah. drum grooves? Yeah. I think that that is highly attributable to the, just like really, really open headroom that I like insist on for that style of music. Uh, there's other stuff like pop and, and hip hop, like I'll, I'll get loud and I don't care. Or if I'm like going spec against someone on something, like 
I'll go loud and I know how to get loud and, and keep it dynamic and awesome. Got down to like negative 3.7 LUFS recently. Like, it was a good day. But for this stuff, like the Afrobeats, like all of it, like African Giant all the way up to the latest Love Dummy. It was, uh, I don't know. I don't look at the meters, but like, I, I believe we were sitting around like negative 11, negative 10 or negative 11 LUFS. Like just really open, just like giving everything a chance to to just have its space. And the thing with Afrobeats, it's not like, you know, where you sit down to mix and you go one track at a time. I'm like, okay, that, oh, I'm going to listen to that conga. I'm going to, okay, hmm, let's do, let's do this plugin. Okay, we're going to EQ that then. And then we're going to, it's like, no, I'm just not doing any of that. It's mostly faders. Those mixes are the most fun to do when you can put all the faders down. And I love that I'm just like, pretend I'm like putting the faders down as if that's how I do it when I'm really, I'm sitting there with my little trackpad. Like, yeah. I put the faders down and just like balance the song, blend it. Like, I do these exercises when I'm not mixing for a client or I just mix for fun where I'll pull up like a board tape. And I have these like multi track board tapes from like previous bands I worked with where it'll be like, you know, a three hour night. So it'll be 360 minute stats and I'll hit play at the beginning of one and I won't ever hit stop and I'll just have faders down and I'll just bring them up one at a time and I'll pretend that the show starts right then and you have to balance it really quickly. And without real faders, like you really have to find out how to do it really quickly. And this is an exercise for me. And then, you know, I throw EQ on everything and, you know, some saturation where I need it or whatever I'm going to use and just like try to get a mix in like five minutes, try to get a mix within that first or second song to where it's happening and it's working. And, and that's kind of where I've been like workshopping my templates that I'm using lately. But the, this is the thing with Afrobeats is like, it, it needs to feel like a performance. It needs to be believable. I've said this like a thousand other times, but like, this is a Greg Scott thing. If you close your eyes and if you envision that you are looking through the window, you're looking through a portal into the environment where the song is being performed where that performance is taking place you need to it needs to be cohesive so every single element needs to have a sense of believability within that it does exist in that reality so like a lot of that is uh reverb or ambience and another thing uh jeff ellis says is uh, does it have compatible ambience and i love that i had to adopt that term as soon as i heard it a few years ago it's like that's exactly right. Like great records have this this cohesive similarity to the space that they all live in. Doesn't mean you need to send everything to one reverb bus. I'll do that sometimes. But uh, it's nice to have the flexibility of, of maybe a, a similar type of reverb bus, but just a, a bunch of versions, a bunch of different ones of it. Now I'm confusing things. But uh, yeah, balancing the mix, keeping it cohesive, keeping it in a space. And um yeah, it's just like, does it sound like a record? Is it is it believable? Do you find yourself getting the opportunity to kind of do the kind of fader down, <clears throat> balance everything on some of the more, I guess, modern records that you're doing? I know sometimes you mentioned that mixing these days can be sometimes more of like a STEM mastering type thing. I yeah, 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 totally. That. So are, are you you get an opportunity to kind of do that or is it you're making more kind of smaller changes on uh, some of the mixes you're doing now yeah uh, i would say it's like half the time so like half the time i'm mixing afrobeats records that's like a big part of my workload and they will always generally just send a session an fl session or a logic session sometimes Ableton. they'll send a session and then they'll send a pile of stems and and so when I put the stems in, it's like, I'm generally given the freedom to, to kind of have some liberty. So I put the stems in and I'll do the faders up thing. Um, when I'm working on an American project, it is uh, most of the time I'm receiving a session. So either Ableton, Logic, or Pro Tools. And that session has been like fully maxed out and decked out. Uh, and man, y'all are going crazy so much so that I had to get a new computer to even like run this stuff. Like, like I said, the busing is just bananas. I'm cool with it. I'm cool with it. Uh, it it's great. I call that like quick mixing because like the song is great and it's done. They, they, they're already stoked on it. So I just got to get in and just refine, maybe help gain stage a little bit, help get a little more out of it. Um, 
you know, try to make the mix like two dB louder than what they had, and but make it sound the same. <laughs> It's kind of the vibe, I guess. Um, yeah, half the time. Now, when you're getting sessions, you're getting like Afrobeat sessions, right? You said mentioned from FL, those dogs, <clears throat> Logic. Um, I know some people say like they have, there's a certain knock that you get from if it's like FL, like there's a certain sound that you get. So, how are you kind of recreating that um, that that just sound in Pro Tools? Yeah, most most of the them? most of the time, I can recreate it. Uh, with a combination of like clip in plugins um but uh if i have the session i i will either do one of two things like i'll, I'll either bounce the kick with the 808 because that's going to be enough low end energy to where it's going to clip it's going to do the sound and then if the kick and 808 were working that way and rubbing that way in the reference that they love and it's something i've been trying to recreate i'll just bounce them as a group and just use that in my mix and pro tools but like a lot of the time now i'm just mixing out of the session um, this was part of my like big initiative of last year was like starting the year out of uh, 2022, just like obtaining every plugin ever. And it was like, this is a big investment, this is, you know, and then, but then I just started to add up how much time I was going to save by getting approvals. Cause like when you're chasing that demo, at least when I was chasing the demos and I was unable to get there, you know, losing gigs and also just wasting time redoing work and redoing work and then eventually asking them to like print specific stems to get back to me so i could like get them in and try to make it sound right nobody's happy ultimately losing work it's like this is going to pay for itself for really really quick for me to get every plugin and be able to open any session <clears throat> that's what i do now and and my hypothesis was correct it's really 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 freaking fast and really really easy to get approvals and I'm, you know, I'm trying to be lazy. Like I, I love to dig in and, and really make fantastical mixes and, and do the dirty work. But like a lot of the time, I'm not being hired to do that. They don't even want that. They just want the stamp of approval from a professional who went through and just used a fine tooth comb to just clean up some things and then send it back. Respect the work that they did because it is oftentimes absolutely fantastic and really doesn't need more than mastering anyway. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to take a mix fee and a point to do it, of course. Uh, we send it back. It's great. All that being said, I love Pro Tools. I would love to just hang in Pro Tools. I'd love to hang on an SSL without Pro Tools. You know, we got to do what we got to do. Are you kind of trying to get back into the SSL kind of style workflow? It's fun. Like when you get in and you're ready. But it's it's really expensive to have a team that can like make that happen. Not only is it expensive to acquire and maintain a console, let alone the electric bills, which has gotten better with the newest on the console. But like uh, prepping a mix on the console can take up to an hour, two hours. Like for that audio movers thing, like we prepped that for like the night before the shoot, like a couple hours. And I was there doing it. And it was, <laughs> And it wasn't fun. And then afterward, it was like, wow. I mean, just start to finish doing the mix plus the prep plus what I, I can't even imagine what it would have been to like print the stems through that. It's just there would have been no possible way to do another mix that day. Or I, by the end of that day, I would have been like, ah, I'll do the rest of the mixes in the box. So it would become like a really specialty thing, I think. If I, if I had a console, it would be like, well, one project will live on the console this month. Yeah, maybe just one and the rest of, yeah, it's just not worth it. Plus the problems it creates when the speakers bounce off, like, like, I don't want to like dog that room or that setup or that console, but like it, it, a lot of the decisions just didn't translate when I got back home, I got to hear it in my space without the desk. It's just the reflections, the comb filtering. It's like something happens in the mids, like the, the mid range, like disappears. This isn't a subtle thing. Like people make fun of me about the no desk movement and it's not subtle. <laughs> yeah, on the topic, I know you're big on like the whole no desk uh kind of workflow. Are you getting a uh, moving into a new studio? Yeah. On, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be it's going to be right over. It's going to be that building right there. It's going to be like a cool ADU. It's going to be a mixed room, a kitchen, a bathroom, like a storage room. And uh, 
my good man, Gerhard Westphalen is going to come down. He's going to treat the whole room and get it outfitted with his beautiful designed panels and treat it all up and make it perfect. And I'm really excited. No two traps. It's going to be these kind of membrane absorbers that he's super into right now. Now, something I wanted to kind of touch on, and uh, you're collecting some interesting pieces of mixing hardware. Are you doing that to use on the mixes, or are you now modeling them, making some new cool plugins? Yes, it's a few things. So I am getting a little bit bored of mixing in the box. Um, I went all in the box sort of out of necessity when we had our first baby. <laughs> it went like this, like as if our baby is this tall and walks around like this. No, baby, there we go. We hold it. No, that's a... That's a guitar. That's a, that's the bass. No, I'm right-handed. So it was like Katrina was like seven or eight months, like walking around, like turning all the knobs and messing up the recall of the mixes. Uh, so I was just like, I need to go in the box and it'll be easier. I'll have a lot more time. I can do offline bounces with Bounce Butler. I can go be more of a present dad. And now she's in school and now our other daughter is is getting quite a bit older too. So it's it's cool. I have time again. I am in the studio way more than I used to be. And I'm like longing for analog. Plus I'm just trying these pieces of gear and I'm like, I'm hearing it. And I'm, I'm not just like turning it on and hearing if I can hear the difference when I AB on or off. It's like, no, you got to really spend time. You got to like mix into it and you got to see how it combines, how it influences your decisions and like how, how things start to rub together and how, how it increases the, you know, your efficiency and proficiency in the workflow. So with all of that, I'm just I'm trying a bunch of stuff to see what's going to come into uh, into the rack. Um, I have a cool vintage Blue Stripe 1176 from 1969. That thing's crazy. Um, I didn't realize like that they're like borderline unusable because of how distorted they are. <laughs> like the CLA 76, the UAD, you know those plugins. Yeah. It's like these sound really good on vocals. This is the uh, this is fantastic. No, uh, at least the one I have is like. It's it's fantastic, but it's like fantastically filthy. It is a filthy, dirty. So when you like run a sine wave through it and you look at the scope, you look at fab filter, manalyzer, or whatever you use, you can see like <laughs> it looks like a triceratops mixed with like shark teeth. It, there's no way to clean it up. It's wild. So I'm, I got one of those. I have a Mac rack. Just shit. Uh, I was trying some fern stuff as well. Yeah, it's 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 all been fun. Um, in addition to that, uh, my business partner, Eddie, who on um, the mixed land stuff, who lives up in Toronto, uh, we've kind of gotten sick of me just sending him gear back and forth. It's gotten like enormously expensive to ship like these really like kind of rare vintage pieces of gear, like across the border and there's customs and the duties and it's, it's messy. So he has been teaching me how to model the gear here and like capture all these measurements and and essentially just like get the device captured into the box. And, and from there I send him that, that info and that data. And then he's the one who does the actually smart stuff and plugs it all in and, and types the code. And man, he is good at that. Um, yeah. So that's kind of all the journey. So we, we were kind of pivoting Mixland too. We, we started off, we were like going to be, our entire mission statement was to make these just really obscure weirdo devices and, really wacky stuff. We were going to be like the, oh, like a prog band of the plugin, you know, domain. Like we're going to take a long time to do a release and, you know, 10 minute songs, like really <laughs> obscure, inaccessible. Yeah. And I found it's like, it's really inaccessible and like some people really love it. And a lot of people just can't grasp it, can't get their heads around it. And whenever we do like an analog -y, like this looks like a real piece of gear. This is simple. Like, it's just it outsells it like a hundred to one. So we've made the like confident choice to just model a bunch of gear and just start doing that. And and we're starting to uh, branch out and work on some signature products with other artists, as well as licensing some equipment from other manufacturers and kind of making plugins for them. So kind of expanding, expanding a little bit. It's all fun. Kind of already mentioned Mixland plugins, but you have some really amazing <laughs> plugins out, including <clears throat> free one, Tilt EQ, right? That is uh, yep. free one and you got rubber band comp. So um, why did you kind of develop these two plugins and what are some different things that you used them on, some different records that you used them on? And well, I, I just felt really inspired to get into the plugin market. And the idea that I had was this, you know, dual stage compressor. So it's like this 
kind of serial double compressor uh, that both of them use this combination of this sort of like infinite variable knee that like the harder you hit the compressor, the more the knee, you know, the harder you dig into it, the more the knee kind of turns inside out and goes to like negative ratios. <laughs> so like the harder you hit the rubber band compressor, it's like, instead of things just kind of pushing downward, the harder you go at it, it's sort of, um, you know, in theory it, it is a compressor. So it's, it is still pushing down, but it, it does this kind of snap back, like really just aggressive kind of version of compression that uh, it was a theory. And I just, I asked Eddie, like if we could try it and it worked and yeah, we decided to, to throw that one out there. That one's obviously really great on drums, um, but I use it on vocals more than anything. Cause it's actually, when you do like a kind of medium fast attack and like a super fast release, it's just like, it is the cleanest. It's just so easy. The, the way that the auto gain is set up, the way he does auto gain is like, it's just, it's the easiest way to level a vocal for me because I can just put it on, I can turn up the snap knob and it just like, boom, like it levels out the peaks and makes the vocal really, really clean and leveled without sounding horribly. I hate like these other ones like Arvox and, and Faraday. Like you have to bring one thing down, you have to set your threshold and then you have to set your makeup gain. Like, or maybe you don't, but like, I, at least I haven't figured out how to use those right. But the same thing, you open up CLA 76 and it's like, okay, let me turn this button off and let me set the release fast. And then let me turn up the input and then turn down the, it's like I've already done like nine moves. I, I, in the time it took me to EQ that, my competition is out there mixing. They mixed 50 songs in the last 10 seconds and I'm here, I'm left in the dust, baby. So yeah, I just, I just, no, it's not that. I just want to be fast. Like I'm already, I'm like, I just want the vocal to work right so I can get the vocal sitting in so I can feel better so I can go work on the drums so I can get the drums feeling great. It's like if the, if the process takes too long and the stuff isn't working, like it really, it just neuters my soul. It just snips at uh, my my heartstrings. So um, yeah, I just wanted to make tools that were incredibly accessible. Filt is really cool because uh, you know you get vocal stacks, you get like fifty put together, and like oh these were all done with an SM7B. Cool. Okay, I got to cut two hundred. I got to boost like five k and up or whatever it might be. And, Built is like, boom, open it, turn that one. Yes, it's good. Copy paste the whole thing or just put it on the bus. Awesome. Put the rubber band comp after it, level it. That's your vocals. Maybe you need a dial, like a Pro Q3 to like cut out a couple things or a soothe. You do you, baby. You do whatever you're going to do. But the, the whole point for me is like I, just using fast stuff, like just so it can enable me and free me up to get on to the next thing. So I can like freeze me up to make the high level decisions, the stuff that actually matters, you know, not that EQ vocals doesn't matter, but like the like background vocals just need to sit back there. It's like, I could almost have an AI script that just does the same thing to all of them. Cause they just, for most of the time, it's like, it's, it's either the SM seven or the recording through the freaking two fifty one, you know, the C 800. And like, I know what I'm going to need to do to these. You kind of talk about your job as a mixer to kind of take the listener through the song and, open different doors and kind of guide them through each section. So what are some techniques you might do or philosophies you might use to kind of achieve that? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's automation, you know? So it's, you got to give them a little bit of a, a little foresight. It, it helps to know what's coming when, when you watch a movie, there's, there's rising action, there, there'll be music that will cue you in, you know, before the scary guy pops out, there's always a little, there's a little, a little head beforehand that like, well, not always. Okay. But uh, generally there's, there's some lead into these things that it, I, I think that it helps not be just completely blindsided by things. And there are of course times where you want to defy expectation and really take a listener by surprise. And that's not really what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about like like a reverse vocal, you know, like a reverse reverb that leads into your verse one. Like that's that's a pretty common one that works, and, and so that's like a production way that you can do it. But like as far as riding faders, um, I'm big on like crescendoing things. So you know, if we're riding towards the end of a post, and maybe the drums are like building up and they're starting to play loud but the way that the producer built it in is that the drums are just compressed. So the performance is ramping up, but the compression is just pushing them down. So it's like, Oh, I'm, I'm going to help this part. I'm going to, 
I'm going to crescendo that to go, 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 go. And then, but then you, you kind of experience it where you get to the chorus and you're like, oh, that crescendo actually got louder than the chorus hit. So then the battle becomes like, am I bringing the chorus up in volume and just kind of grinding it into the bus more? Maybe that actually adds attitude. That's cool. Or maybe I need to bring that crescendo back down or maybe a combination of both. It's kind of a mixture of both. This is why I call it mixing. That's what a mixer does. And that's generally what I'm doing most of the time. Uh, you know, because a lot of these sessions arrive and like the same thing. The song already sounds like the song. Now it just, it needs help. Um, you know, just finding those, those points and like really highlighting the moments of the song that could help, help kind of uh, just lead them, lead the listener. That's awesome how you can like just highlight those little moments in the productions and just to kind of expand on them and, and make them noticeable and really uh, help out help out the song that way now i wanted to uh talk about one song where i think you did kind of i said or uh, i believe you said you helped out with the arrangement of it and kind of added some some more things in than you might usually do on a mix and that is woman by doji cat so mm -hmm. what was that like mm -hmm. that was the best i love that team let's see i've told the story a bunch of times so i wonder if there's like a fresh uh fresh angle i could kind of take on it uh let's just put it this way the team was really really open to to just anything that might elevate it and i don't think anything that i added you know like changed the record like what i did transformed it i'm freaking rad like no like there were some little moves that i felt like we all felt it kind of helped guide the listener one of them was like this reverse reverse vocal that led into that very first the first time she sings on the song woman there's this kind of there's this kind of like it just because in my mind like the song ended and i heard the trail of you know fading away and i just thought well, that might be cool like reverse like leading in because otherwise it was just like really abrupt it was like beat and the beat goes for a while. It's like, it's like a, it goes, we're jamming. And then, oh, and then we're in. Like a little bit of a clue would be cool just to like get us ready, get us up. Cause like when you're at the club, you're dancing, you're at the wedding, you know, whatever's going on, you're like looking around. Part of the experience is looking at the other humans around you. At least for me, I talk about everybody else's experience. Like, like it's my, so in my experience, I don't know what you guys do at weddings. <laughs> You might be dancing all funny over there with the clown shoes on. I'm not sure, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking at everybody and there's like context clues where we know this song, we know like shut up and dance or brown eyed girl or whatever it is that's playing. And it's like, ah, you know, and there's the, there are these like implied moments that help us know, like we are one bar out and nobody's thinking, here we go. We're one bar out. I'm about to start singing to this song at this wedding. No, you just know where to start because your brain did the math for you. It remembers you have the sonic clues that are all built in. So I think some of those sonic clues need to be kind of embedded into the, into records more The just hints, just little hints, little like just flavor moments to just kind of lead you in. It's just kind of an extension of the other answer, I guess. But so that was something I added some of those like explosions, just like little things to like push the chorus more. Oh, I changed the kick. Again, I don't really like the kick. I, I, I would have done a different kick now <laughs> um, had I known. Um, but, you know, we live, we learn. Yeah, I'm not tremendously happy with the sound of that, to be honest, the, the whole the whole record. But, like, some of the other Doja mixes I did, I was like, I was so stoked. Was so stoked. Track two, Naked. That's like... But again, there, it's like, hey, I could use more bottom. Moral of the story is, like, you're never going to be happy. I asked Dave Pensado this. I was like, dude, what's the deal? I can't be happy. I'm a happy guy about everything else in life. Like I, I feel really, really, really blessed, you know, for, for lack of a better term. And he's like, no, I mean, the system is set up for that to, uh, for failure. It's set up to, to disappoint you. You'll never feel adequate. You'll never feel competent and capable of, of making anybody happy. You'll never feel great. So we, uh, we just keep going because it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Yeah. So I just wanted to finish things off and talk about, I know, one person or mentor that it seems like you've been interacting with a lot, and that's Bob Clear Mountain. What are some of the lessons you've learned working with just like such a legend like him? Mm, kiss me out on the river. 
he mixed that, dude. He mixed My Heart Will Go On by Celine Dion for the Titanic soundtrack. He, dude, Bob is one of the best balancers of all time. Uh, he's just, he just rips, man. He completely ripped. He's funny. He, he just takes matters into his own hands. Like I, I was at his studio one day and he was like playing me some like Bob Marley Atmos remixes that he was doing. I was like, this is cool. I mean, who called you for that? He's like, nobody called me. I got the multi-tracks and I just, I'm just doing it and I'm just going to send them in. So they're done the right way. Nobody asked me. To do yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> <Just decided. laughs> so that's inspired me. So that's our new things. Like we're just, we're just going to start making plugins for companies. Like, Hey, you have hardware. You don't have a plugin. You should have a plugin. We just made it. Here it is. Um, yeah, I know. Aside from that, Bob, you know, he's like a super humble. He obviously won the game. He's he's the superhero of the world. He invented mixing. I mean, he's the biggest ego on the planet, but he's he's not, man. He's he's so cool. He's he's reserved. He is genuinely confused as to why people are even remotely interested in what he does. Like he just he's so uh, just almost innocent. Uh, and just he's in it for the love of music uh, and he just is i think he's just happy to be along for the ride and that is exactly how i feel <laughs> and you know the other day is is like you know if if he isn't working on something if he's not hired he's in there doing it anyway he's in there mixing and, and that just reminded me of me it's like man i you know i had a couple weeks earlier this year where I had nothing going on. So I was just, I was just practicing. I was just mixing for fun. And like, he's, he's like the greatest of all time. And he's still 